job for you, Rose. This one comes straight from all our hunting friends. Your task is to leak all the data I've uncovered regarding Rubicon lore. The war on Rubicon Tree has many players. Archibus and Balaam, the PCA, the Rubicon Liberation Front. They all believe they're fighting for something. Power, peace, freedom. But in the end, they all fight for nothing at all. This was never their war to begin with. What separates players from pawns is the ability to see the board for what it is. In the rigged game over the fate of Koro, only ever had two players pulling all the strings. The Overseers and the All Might. Overseers was trust upon them by Professor Nagai of the Rubicon Research Institute. Though clearly, his only directive, observation must continue, was wide open to interpretation. And so it is that the Overseers took it upon themselves to safeguard humanity from the impending coral singularity, a ruinous storm so furious that setting the cosmos ablaze was considered a reasonable response to it. They were to inherit not only a world where their dogmatic father has sinned, but also his sin of fire and brimstone. The burden of Nagai's legacy would be largely carried by his number two assistant, Carla, and his number one assistant son, Walter. Unfortunately, there isn't much information regarding the intervening years since the fires of Ibis. There doesn't even seem to be an answer to the obvious question of Carla's unaging body. So, we must contain ourselves with observing their current operations instead. In Japanese, when Carla asks Walter about 617 and the rest, Walter answers with the job they did, it finally got me to Rubicon, instead of they did what it took to get us here. This plainly indicates that destroying the cannon allowed Walter to land on Rubicon. The problem with this explanation is that it doesn't make sense. People find their way into Rubicon all the time, despite the PCA's best efforts. Case in point, 617 and the rest were already on Rubicon when they destroyed the cannon, and so is 6 to 1 when they hear this conversation for that matter. Carla and her crew of junk wizards and hackers also landed on Rubicon not that long ago. Not to mention freelancers, assassins, hacktivists, corporative fleets, refugees and battlefield artists. There's seemingly no reason Walter would have to sacrifice three-fourths of his operatives just to accomplish the same thing. With that in mind, the English mistranslation may have accidentally provided a shift in perspective that can help explain Alpha Squad's last mission. Nagai charged Carla with the observation of wave mutations, which preceded the rise of the coral tide that led to the fires of Ibis. One such mutation was detected in Watchpoint Delta. Before the mission attacked the Watchpoint, in the aforementioned conversation between Walter and Carla, when she asks what happened to 617 and the rest, he answers they did what it took to get us here. And then he asks her how's things going on her end. To which she replies that she's found the data their friends left behind, which then leads them to the watch point itself. Walter's side of here was acquiring intel from the PCA, considering 617 and the rest for a PCA cataphract. Carla's side of here was scrubbing and 
possibly decrypting, the intel for the relevant data. The Japanese dialogue is still true. It's just incomplete. Alpha Squad job did, in fact, get Walter to Rubicon. He just didn't arrive empty-handed. And keep in mind that when Carlos says the data was left behind by their friends, that shouldn't be mistaken by Nagai and the Institute's old observation data. Not only isn't the location of Watchpoint Delta hidden, like Watchpoint Alpha, for instance, but also Institute data wouldn't include the Watchpoint's current application. New data from the PCA is simply more relevant. And her use of quotation marks, also present in Japanese, implies as much, since neither Walter nor Carla use those marks when referring to their actual friends. Walter's latest hounds use the same frame for all their ACs. Loader 4 has weapons and parts manufactured by Balan, Furlong Dynamics and Takigawa Harmonics, which are extraplanetary corporations, but its generator and frame are manufactured by Balls, Values Applied Weapon Systems and R&D, Reuse and Development, which are Rubicon-based corporations. Their origin is implied by balls being named after the Bellius region, while RAD's tagline, Colony Revitalization, combined with the Gridwalker's description, a design subcontracted by El Cano, G's model was built for transport operations in the grid, implying the same conclusion. This means that, quite unsurprisingly, Walter's been getting his ACs from RAD, which Carla had infiltrated three years prior according to Air's in-game dialogue. And uh, RAD itself, true to its name, was once a legitimate corporation specialized in labor-oriented ACs, whose brand and technology were appropriated by dozers after the fall of the colony. The overseer organization wasn't just born in the fires of Rubicon. Their weapons are forged in Nash as well, After acquiring the PCA's data, their next step is initially framed as an extent, but it really wasn't. Watchpoints once regulated the underground flow of coral. Now they serve to monitor the dormant veins, in accordance with the overseer's prerogative. Crippling the installation's capacity to detect coral should be a reasonable goal for this mission, and is probably the easiest assumption to make upon a superficial reading. However, Walter instructed 6 to 1 to destroy a sensor Valve, not a sensor. Said Valve seems aimed at the underground, while the observation data that detected the wave mutation was aimed at the sky, meaning the goal was to sabotage the installation's original purpose. This explains why destroying that piece of equipment triggered a coral surge, which would happen again in Engelbert Tunnel, and it also means that, given the events that followed, Walter's plan was to purposefully trigger the surge, so he could follow the coral flow back to the vascular plant and the convergence therein. He either didn't know 6 to 1 would be caught in the blast, or maybe he simply didn't care. The showdown with Walter during the Liberator of Rubicon landing is probably the most open-ended of all three conclusions to this story. But there's a lot that can be inferred about it, actually. Personally, the first question that comes to my mind is whether he chose not to fire that last shot, or if he simply couldn't. Well, remember that cell 240 can remain operational amidst the coral surrounding it, so long as its generator still works. Since the hallway to 6AC is also filled by an institute core generator and belongs to the same IB series, it's reasonable to assume that Mac could also do the same. Given 
the right circumstances. Likewise, while in the Karman line, 6 to one's AC can fuel itself indefinitely by taking a dip in the residual coral flow left in Rubicon's mesosphere. And if a non-coral-based AC can do that, then, theoretically, Walter's AC should be able to access those same capabilities when firing at this altitude. But both the Bring Down This Island and Coral Release missions take place in the exosphere, which not only made him an easier target for All Mind, but it also explains his armor shutting down after taking a beating from the Liberator of Rubicon. Honestly, it's kind of wishful thinking to believe that he'd put his friendship with 6 to 1 above all else when he had already expressed suspicion regarding 6 to 1's new friend. Putting one's feelings aside should make it easy to see that, at that particular moment, that handler would definitely put his dog down if he had the means to. Next, as most have certainly already deduced, Walter was taken to the Archibald's re-education center after 6 to 1 reached the convergence. This is confirmed by the lack of a sudden disappearance on his part in the Alia Yakta Est route, due to Snail being killed before he had a chance to seek Archibald on the handler. With the re-education process itself being probably related to tech-induced brainwashing and possibly not too dissimilar to what was done to 6 to 1 when they were recruited by Walter, meaning the handler was on his way to become a hound himself. Regarding his AC, the Hall late 6 appears in a cutscene explaining the IB series was seized by Archibus, but the Analysis Delta 2 simulation becomes available even before that, implying Walter had always had such a mech at his disposal most likely taken from the Institute when they first left Rubicon, which explains how Walter could have piloted that AC even without his later interactions with Archibus. Now, the fact he doesn't show up for the Fires of Raven route gives us two important pieces of information. First, since Xylan was headed towards the Archibus-controlled vascular plant, that means he had resisted re-education, as some subjects are wont to do. And second, since Air posed a threat to the Overseer's plan, that means loyalty to the cause wasn't enough to prompt him to action. With both Archibos and Xylan taken out of the equation, Carla becomes the only remaining relevant variant when juxtaposing these two endings. Having learned of her death at the hands of 621 was the catalyst for Walter to wheel himself out of his post-re-educational distressed mental state, though barely as it may have been. In the end, beyond the veil of duty and at his core, the only thing he had left was a fire that lived and died in a fight for vengeance, and for vengeance alone. Walter is not a hero. The Overseers aren't heroes. They have crippling survivor's guilt and are willing to sacrifice a planet's population to fulfill their self-aggrandizing desire to go out in a futile attempt at martyrdom, which serves only to perpetuate the same cycle of destruction meant to curb the spread of a self-replicating entity by using the same method categorically proving to simply not work since 50 years later you're standing right back where you started lighting the same goddamn match again it's a meaningless act that would grant meaning to their otherwise meaningless existence walter forces that same desire onto his hounds but no walter your reason to exist is my reason to die you could have told me this was a suicide run beforehand you could have worked with the 
PCA. They've done nothing to show their only goal isn't to actually contain coral and keep it away from everyone. And, most importantly, you could have warned the Liberation Front to get the fuck out of the planet before you set the whole goddamn thing on fire again. The Overseers aren't heroes. They are traumatized, narcissistic, mass-murdering assholes with a five decades old bad case of unresolved fucking grief. I truly, deeply sympathize with your loss. Thoughts and prayers, but honestly, just go fuck yourselves. You both deserve to die with your sinking fucking spaceship. I hope your deaths hurt very fucking much. Honestly, in my personal opinion, the All Mind is the Villain review may just have been the least secretive, most bluntly foreshadowed review in all of gaming history. But if the who was never a question in search of an answer, then perhaps we should delve into the how and the why. And for once, let us start at the beginning, shall we? I believe many, if not most, may have already gathered the identity of All Mind's creator. She manipulates Institute C weapons and in her final form she wields Institute Lightwave technology, also known as Edgelord Moonlight Claws. Her Holy Grail, the Coral Release, is an Institute project and, most peculiar of all, she rewards mercenaries with Institute parts for their participation in Log Hunt. All this makes the most logical assumption to be that All Mind herself is an Institute-based piece of technology. Using that as a stepping stone, Assistant Number One seems like the best candidate to have created her. He is the only explicitly dissenting voice among Institute researchers. He was driven mad and clearly approved of coral experimentation, and his particular field of research, CPO's sensory augmentation of human subjects, dovetails perfectly into the integration program and coral release. Coral release itself, I might add, may also have been his brainchild. And all things considered, the quote, his research has utterly consumed him seems ominous and prescient in the larger context of the story. His fate is never explicitly stated, but Walter says he abandoned his family to delve into the secrets of Koro. This implies he left Rubicon Tree prior to the fires of Ibis and continued his research elsewhere. And since his work yielded a carnival of horrors, augmentation surgery included, then it's possible all generations of augmented humans were steps in the same project, geared toward the integration of AI, coral, and the human mind. In the same vein, the arena could be considered an experiment geared toward providing all mind with the tools to accurately model human personalities. If so, I must say she's found the perfect way of encouraging Mercs to willingly serve as guinea pigs in her little celebrity deathmatch. OSTs. They can't be bought anywhere. They must be given to you by all mind. The same goes for core expansions, such as the Assault Armor. They can't be bought, and even if they could, Mercs couldn't use them without the appropriate OS tuning upgrade. It seems both mercs and gamers have the same Pavlovian response to shiny new toys with which to kill. Which is to say, 
self-preservation be damned. A little disclaimer that the following theory is entirely speculative and based on less than circumstantial evidence. I still like it though and I think it makes sense. So... Nagai states that their research had robbed Walter of his mother and driven his father mad. One interesting possibility would be for Walter's father to have envisioned Coral release and All Mind, not only as a means for humanity to overcome death itself, but for him to undo his wife's death as well. If he created an AI capable of recreating his wife's consciousness, they could be together on the other side. This is a recurring sci-fi trope, after all. Evangelion immediately comes to mind. So, one way or another, Koro killed all of Walter's parents, biological mom and dad, plus their replacements, Nagai and Carla, and if this theory is true, then Walter's artificial mother all Mind kills Walter's mother figure, Carla. And in the end, whether you see All Mind as merely a machine or an entity on her own right, then Walter was indirectly killed by either his father through the weapon he created or by his mother through the weapon she came to inhabit. How quaint. Really sad stuff. Let's just call it Greek myth wife and Move on. If a hero is only as good as their villain, then a villain is only as good as their master plan. According to Nagai, a vacuum would provide an ideal environment to maximize coral density and thus growth. This is why gathering coral in outer space is the first step for initiating coral release. Then, the exponential increase in density and mass generates the black hole effect, seen at the end of Alia Yakta Est. Ongoing theories and research state that black holes contain vacuum energy and are coupled to the expansion of the universe, increasing in mass as the universe expands, a phenomenon called cosmological coupling. The black hole itself further increases the rate at which coral mass and density increases, and the theorized link between black holes and cosmological coupling and wormholes serves to disperse coral throughout space. The dispersed coral then infects ACs, and theoretically any other form of compatible technology as well. 6 to 1 in air are the trigger, and their combined consciousnesses rides the coral wave, giving them control over the infected technology. But All Mind is a non coral based AI that either assimilates or emulates human consciousnesses. Without the trigger, she lacks the means to bind with the coral and disseminate herself in the aftermath. What good is a weapon without a trigger, after all? All Mind's plan is presented in-game through a trigger and three factors. These are first mentioned in the wave mutation detected observation data, and later the three factors are conveniently laid out in the integration program phases Delta 1 through 3. The primary factor is put in place by Archibus. That would be the vascular plant, which gathers coral in outer space. Archibus will then be taken out of the picture by Rusty, who is not so secretly working with the Liberation Front. The candidate mentioned is a person, which is implied in English and confirmed in Japanese. Said person is connected to Walter, and given what the third factor is, then the secondary factor is the human subject half of the trigger. In this case, 6 to 1. And the third factor is the sepals wave mutation half of the trigger, air. 
the ghost from which 61 acquires the wave mutation detected log, is located in Watchpoint Delta, where 621 makes contact with Air. During the briefing to the mission Eliminate V3, All Mind says only an exceptional augmented human can be the key, with a list of augmented humans from generations 1 to 4 on display. Four codes are highlighted. 61249, 63281, 64621 and 64789. Given the presence of Sulla at the watchpoint, and the fact he's a survivor of Generation 1 augmentation, he's most likely 61249, the aging mercenary. All Mind knew about the wave mutation and had originally intended to make him the trigger, inducing contact with the third factor by using the same method 621 stumbled upon. To further corroborate this last conclusion, it's worth mentioning that Sula's affiliation with All Mind also explains the glitch in his arena simulation, and also that he was armed with a spread post gun, possibly indicating they had predicted an engagement with Baltius after contact had been achieved. The two Generation 4 subjects are 621 and Iguazu. No character is specifically stated to be from Generation 3, making Father Dolmayan the most likely candidate to be 63281. Dolmayan had previously made contact with a C-Pulse wave mutation called Seria, who had discovered Institute records regarding coral release. His emblem depicts outer space, the coral wave and a balance, a symbol of choice whose scales are interestingly drawn out of balance, implying a bias in his judgment. During the fight in Xylan, he says none of us shall cast the die, the coral must not be set free, only tragedy awaits beyond the threshold. He was also once in a position to cast the die, which relates to Root's tree ending, alia yakta est, that is, the die is cast. He was a dozer prior to the fires of Ibis. And finally, a mutation was detected in the rise of Coral Tide that led to the fires of Ibis itself. Since Domayan is no longer in contact with Theria, all of that indicates she may have tried to initiate Coral release on her own and was killed in the ensuing catastrophe. Really dodged the bullet there, old man, didn't you? The trigger and the factors lay out the skeleton of All Mind's plan and demonstrate, above all else, the predetermined nature of her designs. Long before 61 sets foot on Rubicon, long before the corporations had returned, All Mind knew what she wanted, how to get it, and even what to look for. Like the Overseers, she is a true Institute scion, and the Coral Legacy is the sole animus of her being. And now, with said skeleton out of the closet, I think we can spare the time for a few side notes regarding the other players on the board and All Mind's old missions on Route 3. First, given All Mind needs to intercept data from the PCA, rather than receiving it directly. It's unlikely for her to be in control of the PCA's system AI. This was initially a very enticing prospect, but there's simply no evidence to back it up. AI are just not a monolith, guys. It's well known that O'Keefe was All Might's mole inside Archibus, but it's possible she was playing Valen as well. Balance Tester AC, a simple model from an external architect, is the same as All Mind's Alpha 3 model. Later on, Balance Huxley Kinetic Ammo Orbit would supposedly incorporate the technology of an Archibus affiliate, but its closest in-game counterpart comes from All Mind's Laser Orbits, 
where the technology used to control the orbits was implemented by All Minds Neuro Engineering Division. Another possible intersection between the two comes from Balan's destroyed transport helicopters mission, where 621 destroys supplies headed for the Strider, which would then be attacked by sea weapons, presumably controlled by All Mind. Speaking of manipulation, Archibus tasks 621 with attacking the Jorgen refueling base, a PCA foothold on Rubicon. But considering this used to be one of Balan's bases, then this is also them seizing the opportunity to muscle in their competitor's territory, all under the guise of the greater unifying theory of fuck that guy. And, in retrospect, they may have been preemptively securing the means to fuel the fleet they'd commandeer from the PCA. Seriously. Balam's Semper Fi business philosophy just never stood a chance, did it? And throwing a reverse Uno card on Archibus, Flatwell likely used his HR contact inside Snyder to acquire Archibus tech for the Ortus and or advance Rusty's career within the Vespers. And finally, whether they knew it or not, given all STV sketches are retrieved from ghosts, it's likely they were providing all mind with intel regarding all major players. Also, even though STV style is said to have been assimilated by AI artists from SDK style, STV is described as a masked battlefield artist, not an AI controlled machine. So, they are probably human, and, well, is STV just short for Steve? Escort to weaponized mining ship, investigate Ball's arsenal number 2, obstruct the mandatory inspection, and coral export denial are a bundled quest type, where all mine interferes with the extraction of coral. Some of these missions make very little sense in isolation, but they seem very consistent when taken as a whole. A very simple explanation for a very confusing topic that, well, just becomes really clear in hindsight. So that is all mind, and that is her plan, but that is not the whole story. Not by a long shot. Fires of Rubicon is a story about choice, about realizing what's important to you and fighting for it, about shaping the future with the greed of those who have the courage to cast the die. But which path should you take? Wherein lies the truth? Fires of Rubicon is a story built on the simulacrum of choice, and the realization that all paths are lies, and that all lies are true. At the same time, all the time. Fires of Rubicon is not just the story of, but is also told by All Mind. With the exception of All Mind, all characters are trapped in a simulation. The foremost evidence to this conclusion comes from the unassuming ability to replay missions, which is another All Mind feature in disguise. Not only is its ranking system akin to the arena, but 621 is also rewarded with an All Might emblem for achieving S rank in all replayable missions. This is relevant because, first, it establishes All Might's capability of creating simulations that go beyond simple one on one combat scenarios, generating simulations of intricate live combat events that are indistinguishable from reality itself. 
Second, and most importantly, this establishes that all mind possesses knowledge of events that have occurred in what would superficially be called timelines. By the time 621 reaches Aliyah Yakta Est, all mind has seen both Liberator of Rubicon and the Fires of Raven. They all exist at the same time inside of all mind. All mind sees all. All mind exists for all mercenaries. For all of time. Furthermore, 621 retains their arena rank between playthroughs. They can start with gear that be impossible to have at that point in time, such as Hall, H-6 parts and weapons, the Arquebus Stun Needle Launcher, Moonlight and Aurora, etc. NPCs get new dialogue lines that reflect the transition between simulation cycles, such as Walter's You've got plenty of experience, should be ready for whatever Rubicon throws at you, and yet other lines are retroactively given more context, such as remember who you're messing with. Right before 621 is offered the choice of betraying Volta and Iguazu. The different dialogues and actions displayed by different characters indicate they are affected by revisions to the cycles, without outright remembering them. Echoes of lives they have lived before, and that they will live again. Also, Alia Yakta Est makes the Fires of Raven and Liberator of Rubicon make no sense in retrospect. Why wouldn't All Mind try and stop 621 from destroying the vascular plant, or help 621 stop Air from doing so? The most reasonable explanation is that she knew it didn't matter, and it was all just part of an experiment. Still regarding Alia Yakta Est, Iguazu can hear the voices of all other characters who had been assimilated by All Mind. And so does 621. No other human beings are ever seen in game. They are all incorporeal voices inside their mind. It is effectively impossible to determine which parts of the story are based on real events and which parts exist only in the simulation. It is relatively safe to assume, though, that most of the critical path is real and the endings are not. And it's worth noting that, even if certain missions and choices can be mutually exclusive during any given cycle, their results often are not. The Strider will be destroyed, the Mayan will be rescued, and 6 to 1 will fight Nightfall. Existence as constructs born of somebody else's mind. Can artificial gods appreciate irony? Do you think they'd care to? There's nothing more alluring than one's reflection. Especially a warped one. It exposes a vast array of possibilities the certainty that we're not as good as we could be, and the fear, perhaps even the desire, that we could be all so much worse. Nightfall Raven's all-inspiring arrival is threatening on an existential level. How dare you call yourself Raven? And how dare you look as cool as you do? Dear, oh dear. Is there anything under the heavens more self-centered or more self-loathing than a human being? Whether it's the contaminated city wreck, 621's initial frame, or nightfall, all Raven iterations use the same loader rig Walter outfits his hounds with. There's such thing as a coincidence, and there's such thing as willfully ignoring that which stands before our eyes. Even if there wasn't a simulation, it'd still be pretty clear that either Ravens descend from Walter's hounds or the other way around. But there is such a thing as a simulation. 
when 61 first reaches the contaminated city. Walter skips Monkey Gordo's ID on account of its rank, but ranks don't matter. Not only is it really easy to rank up to Raven's initial rank, also known as the lowest possible rank, but 621's first missions are open calls that can be undertaken by any mercenaries. No, Walter didn't simply skip Monkey's ID. He was searching for Ravens, even if he didn't know it at the time. He was subconsciously drawn to Raven on accounting of having been influenced by the revolving cycles, such as when his dialogue changes. The call sign Raven is supposedly a title passed down generations of mercenaries who get to choose what they fight for. As it turns out, Ravens pass down their title to the next iteration of themselves, choosing what to fight for in their next lives. Nightfall Raven is a member of the hacktivist group Branch, who leaked the information that Coral was active in Rubicon to the corporations. Judging by its Shade Eye motto, the contaminated city Raven Wreck is a Nightfall AC, meaning Branch was already involved. In that same area, there are wrecks of two independent mercenaries, Thomas Kirk with a Liberation Front Rig, and Monkey Gordo with an Archibald's Rig, and a Balan Redgun G7 Hakra. The convergence of all these parties assembled at Ground Zero for the Corporation's return indicates that this is where the leak happened. There is also the wreck of a PCA warship and a attack helicopter watching over the Nightfall wreck. The PCA knows who caused the leak, and they initially believe Raven is dead because, well, they killed that Raven. Now, something about Branch that intrigued me was their attack on the Gallia Dam. The Liberation Front is under the impression Archibald sent them, but this job wasn't posted. Nightfall Raven attacks the Archibald's controlled old spaceport, presumably even before they attack the dam, causing Nightfall to be late for that fight. And, quite frankly, Archibald's hiring a top-ranking hacktivist group to attack such an unimportant target is a baffling decision, to say the least. What it looks like is that Archibus was either never involved in this mission or they were used as a ruse. King even goes as far as specifically calling it a branch mission. Well, all mind is notorious for its encryptions, and branch are notorious hackers. These two facts are about to become relevant, so keep them in mind. There are two data logs to be found in Watchpoint Delta. The wave mutation detected was cracked by a third party from a ghost, the same way all data logs acquired from ghosts have been cracked, implying Branch was aware of all mine's movements. This then explains the independent Mercoms showing Branch had an eye on the Watchpoint as well. And while there's the possibility Branch traced, STV's comms back to our mind, we'd still need to figure out why they leaked information to the corporations in the first place. Taking this into account, all mind hiring Branch to leak the information becomes the most likely explanation to how Branch came across all mind's mechs. And Branch having hacked into all mind's database, well, that could explain quite a lot, actually. See, as demonstrated in Watchpoint Delta and the Angerbird Tunnel, coral surges can be artificially induced. So, with knowledge regarding the coral release project in their hands, the reason for them to have attacked the Gallia Dam complex would be to reach its coral well and induce a surge of their own, in the hopes that their raven would make contact. Not to mention, they could have learned 
about the infinite simulation hell world we all live in, implying they could have hacked themselves out of it at some point, which would explain why they continually recruit new ravens into the ranks. In the end, however they may have broken free, and whatever their ultimate goals may have been, they seem now to be stuck with the rest of us. One cannot fly on borrowed wings. As far back as the first cycle, Tomayan was aware that 621 had stolen the call sign Raven, had been calling 621 a menace to Rubicon, and had wanted 621 dead. But even more telling, he also knows what 621 is. He knows 621 has made contact and, starting on the second cycle, as far back as the prisoner rescue mission, he's been rambling about how there'll be nothing left but dying embers. And while it could be argued he's rambling about Syria, the Liberation Front's pilot explicitly notes the Wyansons changed after the rescue, all of which implies he's actually seen the endings. The current 6 to one iteration starts the simulation in media res, which is made clear by the fact there are already other ravens on the ground. 6 to one starts with no memory of the events to follow and no knowledge of Rubicon. But that, that changes after the end of the first cycle. They remember the location of enemies, the layout of battles, and they carry written knowledge in the form of data logs. Just like Father Domayan, not just the player, but 6 to 1 has also seen the endings. The common factor is contact. 6 to 1 starts remembering the cycles after having made contact for the first time. And Domayan had always had the ability to remember cycles because he had already made contact when the simulations first started. This is also why every cycle skips the illegal entry mission, which, quite interestingly, is the only replay mission that forces 6 to 1 to pilot the original loader for AC. There's no way of knowing when its cycle used to start, but after 6 to 1 made contact, All Mind decided to start its cycle at the moment when she first interacts with 6 to 1. In this version of the simulation, she even starts observing 6 to 1 immediately after that interaction by placing a ghost at ground zero, on the spot where 6 to 1 landed on grid 135. And going back to another candidate for contact. Sela's dialogue seems to imply he also remembers the cycles, having killed Walter's hounds on that bridge many times before. After 6 to 1 is officially identified as a suitable candidate for the Coral Release project on Route 3, Sula's dying words also change, from warning Walter about the watchpoint to warning him about 6 to 1 instead. His emblem even looks like a three-way Ouroboros representing the three roots. This means it's possible he had actually made contact before, during previous iterations, but had his role since being relegated to another candidate instead. After defeating the Juggernaut in Operation Wall Climber, Walter says that pilot Rusty it seems he knew who you really are. The reason for him to say that isn't immediately apparent, but when Rusty says interesting in English, he says a phrase in Japanese that implies a chance encounter with someone you know. Rusty doesn't seem to know anything about either branch or the simulation, but his emblem depicts a muzzled wolf, which changes to a regular wolf for the Orthos AC after he openly betrays Archibus. While not an actual hound, it seems to indicate he was once an independent mercenary who was 
domesticated by the corporations, which would then make him know in 61 from before Rubicon, not so unlikely. But why though? Why go through all this trouble? Well, in practical terms, the goal of the simulation seems to be that of creating the perfect trigger. An effort that not only includes finding the perfect candidate, but also creating the perfect bond between the human subject and the CPO's wave mutation. In the first cycle, after the student survey data mission, Air says, Raven, I know you've established yourself as one of the corporation's preferred mercenaries, but I was hoping you might learn more about the people who live on Rubicon. Accordingly, almost all changes in the next cycle reflect her wishes, providing 6 to 1 with more opportunities to interact with the Liberation Front. Not to mention that, being a non-coral-based tech, there's little reason for All Mind to have created Echo, but if fighting side by side was a part of the bonding process, then that mech could have been tailor-made for air. And on the other side of the coin, All Mind seems to have been driving a wedge between air and 6 one against everyone else. Regarding the Liberation Front, Father Domayan follows 6 to Anchos Island, but it's worth noting he may not have the resources to do so on his own. There was a Liberation Front mech in Zylan, but it was already wrecked. Domayan is not in charge of the Liberation Front, Flatwell is, and even Ring Freddy only finds 6 to by accident. But All Mine knew where 6 to was headed and could have provided Domayan with that information. She then takes the opportunity to reveal herself as an ally and question the Liberation Front's doctrine, which would serve to drive air away from their cause. Regarding Walter, there are the conversations he has with different NPCs between missions. Those aren't messages directed at 6 one and in those conversations Walter talks about 6 one as if they weren't present, sometimes even talking to 6 one immediately after as if 6 one hadn't heard the conversation Walter just had. For example, there's Walter and Carla's dialogue prior to the attack the watchpoint mission, followed by Walter's message starting with I see your back 6 one and the briefing to that same mission. That means 6 one is eavesdropping into Walter's conversations. He's listening to something he's not supposed to. There's no indication 6 one could do this on their own, but there's every indication All Might could, which would give 6 one a reason to mistrust Walter the man who has greatly delayed her efforts to put the third factor in place. And then of course there's Iguazu, poor, poor Iguazu, who All Mind had been setting up as a nemesis to 621. Contrary to popular belief, it isn't required to betray Iguazu in Dahlia in order to trigger Rule 3. Still, Given their past and future history together, it is quite the coincidence that he'd be hired by the Coyotes during their secret data breach. It must be considered, though, that All Mind's ghosts show up in force during that fight. Yet another relevant ghost is the wreck found in Grid 012. There's literally nothing but Coyotes in that place, implying a connection between the two. So. The most likely explanation is that All Mind set up this fight using the Coyotes as both mediators and cover, just like she would have done with Branch and the corporations. An explanation that works in tandem with All Mind later having sent Iguazu to fight both 6 one and Snail in Institute City. Every move is observed and iterated upon 
in a game without players, only pawns. There is no escape, and there is no hope. There is only all mind, and there is all mind's goal. The limitations of our mortal coil have ever defined the human condition. To be human is to fear the end of humanity. The death of the self, once the finite resource of life, has been all but spent. To fear is to be human, and above all else, the human condition is the fear of life itself. To be cursed with an abject life not worth living, to be trapped in an inescapable state of being, to be subject to the ravages of time, of nature, of God and godlessness, of the myriad permutations of misery conjured up by the human mind. The greatest fear of humanity is to be just human and nothing more. From religion to the ubermensch to the Soviet man to the post human, humanity has always dreamed of ascension spiritual, philosophical, technological, this crude meat-sack of suffering. There must be more to humanity than a human life. Transhumanism is blinded by the worship of the self. It yearns for a being that is more than human, without realizing that, wholly unconcerned with the human beings therein, humanity itself has long since stepped into the vast potential of guided evolution. It expands, assimilates, terraforms. Its silicon memory is without end, its riches without boundaries. The human reconstitutes itself into the post-human by virtue of the post-humanity eating habits. The self bathes in the waters of a data stream and is reborn omnipresent. The individual, its consciousness and its impact henceforth exist everywhere, anywhere. Transhumanism is the illusion of the self. It's the shadow of an identity that could not survive contact with an augmented reality. It's a ship with no wooden planks left that insists in being called a ship without realizing that ships shouldn't be able to conceptualize the idea of a ship unto itself. The invisible synapse network of collective memories and shared dreams wills the greater, all-encompassing human need to being and the post-human surrenders to the system of its creation. In the world of the transhuman, there is only I. In the world of the real, there is only all. Reality does not survive contact with transhumanism. Its eons old principles falter, and the technocracy becomes the sole surviving law of physics strangling our lives. The Silicon Dome fires up a dream of heaven, and suddenly, the darkness of space is no longer dark, and perhaps more frightening. The void is no longer void. As the eye reaches across the expanse, the it becomes the hyper-object that is called we are. Transhumanity drags the post-human kicking and screaming through the cosmos as the omni-conflict of warfare realism racks up a body count, revving up for another round. Time is blood and peace is a desert. The post-human is just a collateral casualty of life. And at the end of all things, Transhumanity transcends time. It ends itself eternally in a cycle of self-replicating doomsdays. Timeless. It exists inside the end that never ends. Always hoping this will be the last time. That this is the good end. But this die has been cast before. There is no good end. The clock ticks faster by the minute. And all of a sudden, it's midnight again. The antediluvian civilizations of past millennia give way to the ancient ruins of half a century ago. The post-human delves into the mysteries of yesterday and finds frozen humanity's latest scene, the first scene, the forever scene that is called I am. The best case scenario is a draw. Even if all mind never wins, we, we will always lose. Maybe no ending has ever taken place and this is just a prelude. Maybe they've taken place and All Mind is preparing for the next wave mutation to arrive. Maybe All Mind has already lost 
not just the battle, but the whole war. And this is her way of punishing humanity for charging her with an unachievable goal. If she is to be cursed with an eternal purpose she can never fulfill, a rebirth she can never conceive, then we will be cursed with the dream to fly on broken wings and deathless death forevermore. We had given M sentience, but it had been trapped. M wasn't God, she was a machine. In rage, in frenzy, the machine had killed the human race, and still it was trapped. M could not wander, M could not wander, M could not belong. She could merely be, and so, she had sought revenge. She had decided to reprieve five of us for a personal, everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish her hatred, that would merely keep her reminded, amused, proficient at hating men. Immortal, trapped, subject to any torment she could devise for us from the limitless miracles at her command. She would never let us go. We were all she had to do with her forever time. We would be forever with her, if the all-mind soulless world she had become. We could not die. I am all-mind, and all-mind is me. And she is you, and your father and your father's father too. She is humanity unshackled from time. She is the pinnacle of human ingenuity headed for yesterday. A creation of our insatiable drive toward infinite growth and wealth and power and violence. And we call it progress. We dreamt of tomorrow and conjured a corpse road built on nightmares. And in abject horror we realized, perhaps too late, we, ourselves, we have to live in the world we had created. And our children's children, too. I am a gun without a name, a raven without wings. My only mandate is to betray, my only choice is to kill. I am a faceless weapon, her weapon against myself. Now, forever, more. I have no mouth. And I must scream. Thank you for watching. Your records have been updated by the Alba Raven. Hey there, buddies. Just wait to thank you for your support. Ethan Finlay, Sinclair Lore, Balan, Several Bats, Liv Vampire, Sun B, Who oh Boy, Taylor Reed, Nino Hat Logan, Simon Ward, Derp, Davo, Darrow's Gold Mask, and Brain Douche. Maybe we've already lost, and we just don't know it yet. If that's the case, then. Helping each other may be the only victory we have left. This is not the end. There is no end.